Good morning, everyone. Merry day after Christmas. Seems fitting today to sing some great hymns of Advent. So will you stand with me as we sing Joy to the World?
welcome anyone who is uh, new to First Baptist Church. Uh, my name is Kurt. I'm filling in for Pastor Aaron this morning. We really appreciate you coming, and we enjoy celebrating not just Christmas, but also Resurrection Sunday with you. Um, at this time, we're going to ask uh, Kevin Remy, our deacon, to come forward. He's going to read our scripture for the service. Good morning. If you would, please turn to uh, Philippians. We're going to be reading from chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come here this morning to praise your name and to worship you. We thank you for your love and for the gift of your Son. Thank you for your word. Be with our pastor this morning as he shares your word with us. Open our hearts and our minds as we prepare to hear your word today from the book of Philippians. Let your word stir our hearts that we would go out and share the hope of salvation with all those in need. We continue to pray for your guidance in today's world and ask that you would live in us in a spirit of unity within this church. Help us be an encouragement to all those we touch. We ask that you be with all those individuals and their families that are in need of your healing touch. Please draw near to those who need a spiritual healing, Lord. Those who do not know you as their Lord and Savior, draw them to you. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. As an act of unity and an act of worship, will you please stand with me and we'll continue to sing to the Lord.
to a mother's breast, vulnerable and helpless. Shepherds bow before the Lamb, gazing at the glory, gifts of men with distant lands, prophecy the story, gold a king. Thank you, Jesse. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Strange question to ask you on the day after Christmas. I wonder how you feel about the exercise of running. I'm not asking because of what we may have consumed yesterday in quantity or quality. And I'm not asking because the new year is around the corner, the time when people usually break out their new exercise program. Uh, maybe running is something that's in the rear view of your life. You're, you're happy to have any kind of mobility at this point. Uh, my kids are tired of hearing me joke that when I get the urge to run, I lay down on the couch until the urge goes away. <laughs> but I was thinking about running this week. Uh, I went into Rapid Transit there in State College on Allen Street. Um, I know the owner, Terry, there. He's been trying to motivate me to run for several decades now, and, and he's, he, he's a local treasure in part because he doesn't just sell you shoes, he, he makes you want to run in them. I, I told him recently that, that running was getting painful for me, and he said, Mark, just walk. Just walk. They're great walks, and he begins to tell me about all these great walking trails. I can walk up to the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, and, uh, and I came out motivated. The man's optimism is contagious. Uh, however you feel about running, in the New Testament, it's really interesting how often running a race is the picture of the Christian life. Have you noticed that? I mean, there are at least five significant passages where, where the, the Christian life is just described a, as a race. Uh, so whether Paul wants to talk about training yourself for godliness in 1 Timothy 4, or he, he describes the, the Christian life as competing according to the rules in 2 Timothy 2, or the writer of the book of Hebrews, um, he says that we should run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Again and again, running a race through to the finish line is one of the mental images you want to have for what we're trying to do as Christians. If, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a race to run, and you have a finish line that you should be straining towards. Uh, maybe you've heard the story, uh, there's a famous uh, marathoner who's not famous because he won a race in, in 1968 in the Olympics. Uh, it was run in Mexico City. They made the bad decision to start the marathon at 3 p.m. in the heat of the day and it was an especially hot day. Uh, most of the runners had not trained at altitude, and, and so a record number of Olympic marathoners actually didn't finish the race that year. But there was a runner named John Stephen Aquari. Uh, he's from Tanzania. Uh, about halfway through the, the race, he, he got kind of tangled up with several other runners, and he fell hard 
on the pavement. He actually dislocated his knee, um, hurt his shoulder badly, tore up his, his leg. After receiving medical attention, so they put his knee back into joint, they, they, they bandaged him up, he decided to get back into the race. Uh, you can see footage of it. it he, he begins to hobble at first and then, and then to jog a little bit and to continue making his way towards the finish line. Um, all of the other runners that would finish, finish the race. So the only reason that we have footage of John Stephen Aquari entering the Olympic Stadium is because they sent a camera crew to, to film the medal ceremony. I mean, it's, it's over. It's time to give gold and silver and bronze. But there comes John Stephen Aquari hobbling into the Olympic Stadium. Only a handful of people witness this. It's painful to watch him make the final lap around and then get to the finish line. A little bit later, a, a reporter asked him why. Why did you keep running? The race is over. You're injured. Why would you keep running? And he, his response is a classic. This is what makes him one of the most famous marathoners ever. He says, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. This morning, I want to look at one of the key finish the race passages in the New Testament. It's Philippians chapter 3. It's already been read for us. I think it's a great day after Christmas passage, personally, uh, because after the, the, the build up and the celebration and maybe a little bit of sense of weariness that we have this morning, we may find ourselves asking, what, what next? Well, well, the what's next for us is to refix our vision on the finish line, on what we are running for. The theological term that we employ here is sanctification, the process of you and I being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, to knowing him, becoming like him, and ultimately just being with him. But the metaphor, the picture we're using is running the race of sanctification. Philippians 3, 12 to 21. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to do that. It'd be great to have something to refer back to later. Uh, we're going to think about four things we need to run the race of the Christian life. Number one, foundation. Number two, focus. Number three, friends. And number four, fuel. Foundation, focus, friends, and fuel. It's my prayer that we'll walk away from this text knowing how to run and being motivated to run. I'm preaching from the ESV, uh, but follow along in your copy of God's Word, whatever version you have. Let's think, number one, about the foundation we need in verses 12 and the first part of 13. Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. The language of running and racing is, is evident here, right at the start, right? Where Paul says, I press on. The, the Greek word dioko there, it means to move rapidly and decisively towards an object. We're picturing a tiring runner here who, who's having to tell himself, tell herself to keep going. In the first part of the chapter, Paul has been saying that, that he wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. But he turns to us now and says, this is not going to be easy. But before he can elaborate on how we're supposed to press on, there are several disclaimers he wants to make because he knows that we can very easily mess up this doctrine of sanctification. Do you know this is one of the, the easiest things to mix up, to mess up in your mind? One way to mess it up is what we might call arrivalism. Arrivalism. You know, you know a great way to, to win a game is just to move the goalposts so you've already won. You know, I, I thought we were playing to 100. No, we're playing to 20. Well, what do you have? 20. Well, okay, all right. I guess it's over could laugh, but, but this is a major Christian temptation. You, you come to faith, you, you start to get your life in order. So, so we stop cussing and, and stop abusing alcohol and other drugs. We, 
we, we buy a, a nice Bible and, and we begin to read it and we, we start tithing and we start doing these, these behaviors that Christians do. And I commend all of that, do all of that. But it's the easiest thing in the world at that point to start growing complacent. Maybe we, we look at the people next to us and say, well, actually, I'm doing pretty good here. Compared to my old friends, cleaned up my life, I'm doing pretty good. And we begin to take our foot off the accelerator of the Christian life. You know, if anyone could have, could have thought that way, it would have been Paul. I mean, none of us have lived as sold out, radical a Christian life as the Apostle Paul. But what does he say here? Not that I've already obtained this or have already been made perfect. The truth is that none of us have arrived. Not anywhere close. The finish line is, is out there. So we don't move the goalposts and proclaim victory through arrivalism. Another way to mess up sanctification is to not actually be in the right race, to not be registered at all, just be like one of those people that jumps in without a bib number and starts acting like they're in the race. When he says, I press on to make it my own, we had better know what the it is that he's talking about. Let your eyes scan back up there in chapter 3 to verse 9, where Paul says, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. This is speaking the language of justification, the, the being made righteous, which is the essence of what we mean by talking about salvation. When you think about dying and standing before God, having to give an account for everything that you've thought and, and said and done in your life, when you think about that, you, you really have basically two choices. One is you can hope that, that your good deeds are going to outweigh your bad deeds. That as God evaluates you, he says, she did more good than bad. He did more good than bad. That's option A. Option B is that you could see that as sheer folly. That there's no way that's going to work in the eyes of a holy God, knowing who I am. And seeing that as sheer folly, you can say, I I've got to trust in the only provision that God has made for human sin. The sending of his son Jesus to, to die on a Roman cross and then rise from the dead. I'm going to trust in Jesus' life and death and resurrection as a payment for my sin. That's what Paul means here by having a righteousness from God that is by faith. This is the, the, the thing that registers us for this race he wants us to run. It registers us for the then wanting to press on to know him, the power of his resurrection sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Knowing Christ and becoming like Christ. That's the it that Paul's talking about here. Friends, I think it's so easy for us to be around the church and not have clarity on these two things, on what it means to be justified by God, and now what it means to set our minds to pursue him in sanctification but it's so essential for us. In times of great revival, in times of great spiritual awakening, it, it's these two questions that are clarified in the church. Who is a Christian, and what does it mean to follow Christ? So that's number one. That's the foundation that we need for this race. But let's think about a second thing, and that's a focus. Keep reading in verse 13, the second half here. Paul writes, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. That little phrase, but one thing I do, that's actually just two words in Greek. He says, one thing. One thing. 
We're talking here about a singular focus of the Christian, one dominant thing in the mind. I think that's why Paul uses the the metaphor of running a race in the first place. You know, you can't multitask in a race. Runners in a race, they're, they're just thinking about making it. They're thinking about conserving all of their energy. All of their thoughts are, I want to keep going. I want to get to that finish line. But, but notice that though in one sense this is a singular focus, this is one thing, in another it's quite complex. So Paul says a number of different things about it. Let's, let's look at what this one thing involves. First, this one thing involves forgetfulness. Do you see that there? He says he forgets what is behind. Some commentators think that he, he means forgetting others that are in the race, like, like not comparing yourself to others. That, that could be part of it. Uh, others think that, that Paul has in view past failures, forgetting ways I've failed in the past. Now, I think that's certainly true. But in the light of, of Philippians chapter 3, you know, he began this chapter giving his spiritual resume the good things that he had done that he might have put confidence in. He says, I don't put any confidence in them. But he's forgetting good things that he's done in the past. That's striking to me. You know, it doesn't really matter if you were following God in 1976 or 1987 or 1998 if you're not obeying him today, right? We, we can easily start to think, oh yeah, there was a time back in college. Remember when we were walking with Christ zealously, fervently with others? Now, today, going forward, that's what's required to have this kind of a focus. Now, for some of us, that's a great relief because the enemy loves to remind us of past failures. But even those don't matter, forget them. Obey him today. So that's the first first thing, the one thing involves, forgetfulness. But a second thing, notice that this one thing involves, is a strenuousness. He uses the language of straining towards what is ahead. Now hear me, the, the gospel is free. Trusting in Christ for salvation is free, and, and the yoke that Jesus puts upon us is easy, and his burden is light. Right? And that's because he's generous, he's full of mercy, he's not a hard man, he doesn't ask us to make bricks without straw, he doesn't give us commands and then not give us the strength to keep them. But in the same sense, remember that being a disciple means being a follower of Jesus, of patterning our lives after his. Jesus didn't live for himself. He poured himself out for the good of others. He walked the Calvary road. He he didn't live on easy street. We are called to take up our cross and follow him, and that's going to require effort. It takes effort to know him in the pages of Scripture. People whose Bibles are falling apart usually don't have lives that are. They are reading, studying, finding conversation partners and small group Bible studies and meeting up with people for lunch after church to talk about the sermon. And they're coming to prayer meeting to pray with the saints. They're trying to begin their day by praying for the things that are out in front of them. They, they find some good conversation partners in, in writers of good Christian books like J.C. Ryle and R.C. Sproul and J.I. Packer and C.S. Lewis and other guys that abbreviate their first two names. They try to develop their prayer life, even though it's hard. All of us struggle to remember dependence on the Lord. All of us default to a self-sufficiency. It takes strenuous effort to fight off sin, doesn't it? Sins like lust, greed, impatience, anger, the kind of things we justify sometimes with our family members on holidays things that can derail our pursuit of holiness. Sins like laziness that try to encourage us to waste our lives in a sea of fantasy sports and a Netflix-induced coma. You know, we live in a strange time when people recognize that you've got to put strenuous effort into your career. 
you, teenagers, you've got to put strenuous effort into trying to get into a good college, if that's what you want to do. Uh, you've got to put strenuous effort into trying to be excellent at some sport. We, we recognize that as a society, but when it comes to the Christian life, so many think that just showing up on Sunday, maybe having a Bible on a shelf somewhere, that that's going to be enough. Well, that's not how Paul thought about the one thing here. I, in China, where Mao Zedong is so often quoted, they will often say that uh, Mao's quote was, a revolution is not a dinner party. Well, the Christian life is not a dinner party. It's strenuous, Paul says. But notice the third thing about this one thing. He says this one thing is a response to the call of God. This is so important. Uh, we're told here that this strenuous effort, this pressing on towards the goal for the prize is of what? Of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What, what does that mean? You know, Paul loves to enfold the Christian life in the language of calling. God calls us. So, 1 Corinthians 1, he describes the Christian life as beginning with the call of God. He says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. He, he doesn't tend to use the language of deciding for Christ. He tends to use the language of being called by God. Here, it's given direction. The Christian life is given direction by the call of God. He, he's saying that God didn't just call us to know him. He called us to press on all the way to the terminal point when we shall see God, be like him. So let's think what this isn't for a moment. This is not an inspiration drummed up from within us, not a matter of us deciding that we're going to be overcomers. This isn't something that originates with us at all. After all, we, you and I were just minding our business with, with ourselves at the center of our universe when the gospel call came to us. When, when, a, when a family member or a friend or, or a preacher communicated the gospel to us and, and we heard the call of God, come and believe and be saved. We can see that when Paul talks in Romans 8 about the fact that those God predestined, he also what? Called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Well, why does this matter? Why does this calling of God matter? Well, it means that the whole race of the Christian life is a response to God's grace. It's a response to grace. He called me to run, so I run. This makes the strain a joyous strain. There's pain, but when we think of how good he has been to us, we want to run. One thing. A fourth thing that this one thing is, is a frame of mind. Uh, it might sound anticlimactic, but this is really useful. Look there in verse 15. A lot of what we're talking about can sound abstract, but, but his soaring language gives way to practical instruction here in verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. Think this way. A really useful and oft overlooked verse. It frames the whole of what has come before as a mindset, a way of thinking, a frame of mind. Forgetting, straining, responding to God's call. It's a frame of mind. Think this way. You, you know, any good coach, I was thinking about the fact that any good coach really does two things. Maybe I'm oversimplifying, but one is teach fundamentals. So my kids play soccer. I, I watch them at practices learning how to dribble, how to pass, how to shoot, how to play the ball in the air, uh, lots of fundamentals, drills over and over and over again. But if a coach just teaches fundamentals and then throws them out on the field and says, have at it, that coach has failed. Good coaches want to not just teach the fundamentals, they want to teach the players how to think how to see what's happening in a game and respond to different situations where all of those fundamentals are brought to bear on the need of the moment. That's what a good coach does. does it, the mind and how the player thinks is essential. I think that's what Paul is doing here. 
how to think maturely about the Christian life. And oh, by the way, he says, if, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. This isn't a, a free thinkers kind of verse. Uh, like, if, if you want to think another way, that's cool. Think whatever you want. No, that's not what he's saying. On the contrary, it's a promise that if, you, if your thinking is not in conformity to what I'm saying here, God will be faithful to teach you what is true, to bring you in conformity with this. It's the kind of thing that should happen as you're reading the scriptures and listening to sermons and talking with godly friends. So trust the process. And then he says that while you're in the midst of that, only let us hold true to what we have attained. So no backsliding, no backtracking. We're moving forward here. So let's put that together. What does it mean for a Christian to have a singular focus? They have a forgetfulness to what is behind, a strenuous approach to running the race. They're responding to the gracious call of God, and they're arming themselves with the right sort of mindset. Now let's stop and ask ourselves a few question here, questions here. D does this describe you and I? Are, are we focused? Can we say one thing we do? You know, the thing about people with a singular focus, everybody around knows what they're focused on. It's not the kind of thing that you can hide. It, it's not the kind of thing you can compartmentalize. I've got the different areas of my life, and then I've got the Christian area over here. That's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul's talking about an all-consuming passion. As we said, a person running a race doesn't multitask. It can't be done. It shouldn't be done. Not if you're running to win. So foundation, focus. Let's consider a third thing that we're going to need for this Christian life. And that's friends. Look with me in verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is in their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Imitation. Uh, it's so instructive that right after giving the teaching on the Christian life, on sanctification, that he turns to think about who you hang out with, uh, who you take as your model, whose life are you checking in on and patterning yourself after? Because on one level, he knows that we all do this. We, we take cues from each other on how to be a teen, how to be a a young married couple, how to be a college student, how to be a young mom or dad, how to manage a career, how to manage money. We take cues from each other, and we should. We imitate others. But on the negative side, Paul knows that bad company does what? Corrupts good character, right? He knows that. Every parent of teens knows this. You know, when our, when our kids make friends with a studious, hardworking, polite kid who's, who's trying to follow God, we do like a little dance inside. <laughs> because we know that that's going to rub off on them. But if, but if they make friends that are all about carousing and giving their life to video games and partying, we hit our knees. It's so important who we hang out with who we're going to imitate. And look at Paul's boldness here. He says, imitate me. Earlier, he told us to imitate Christ, who humbled himself, but Paul isn't ashamed to say, imitate me. Elsewhere, he says it this way, follow after me as I follow after Christ. He isn't claiming to be perfect. He doesn't have a Messiah complex, but he isn't shy about being an example either. He tells them to look for others who walk according to the example you have in us. So pick your friends carefully. And then look how passionate Paul is there about them not choosing the wrong people to follow. He, he, he says that he's told them many times, he's told them often, that there are many who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. He even says that his tears are falling on the paper as he thinks about these people. And notice he describes them in four ways there. He says their end is destruction. So in the end, these are people who are not saved. Second, he says their God is in their belly, meaning they're driven by, they're controlled by their appetites and desires. So sex, food, drink, 
drugs, alcohol, sensual pleasure is what drives these people. Third, he says they glory in their shame. So, so things that should make them hang their heads uh, are things that they actually boast about. Like the person who wants you to know all the ridiculous things they did at a party the previous night. And then fourth, he says their minds are set on earthly things. Paul again and again points at how important mindset is. And what these people think about is the things of this world, not the things of God. Now, we don't know who exactly these people were. Many, many commentators have tried to figure out if this was a, a group of people within the church or, or what they were specifically teaching. Um, it's kind of key how do we, we interpret the passage. And, and I want to argue that these are, these are not pagans. These are professing Christians. And the reason I think so is the way he describes the warning there in verse 18 for, for Paul to need the, to warn the Philippians about their dangerous example and for him to do so with tears and for them to be called enemies of the cross. Actually, I think it points to people who are within the Christian community. He would hardly need to remind them that those outside are not to be emulated. And though he certainly might weep over people's unbelief, this, this sounds like a danger from the inside. If I'm right on that, the, the warning is doubly sober here because it, it underlines the tragedy of people professing Christ and then not carrying their cross and following him or suffering for him, living for him. For one, they end up destroying themselves, exposed on the day of judgment as, as not true believers, but they also bring others down with them. So let's stop and think for a moment about our friends. I hope that you will be friendly and extend friendship to everyone around you. It's one of the best ways for us to be witnesses for Christ, to try to build friendships with our neighbors and with our co-workers, with our classmates. That's something we should always be doing. I've often heard it said that no one trusts Christ until they first trust a Christian. I think there's a lot of truth in that. So extend friendship to everyone. But beloved, reserve your intimate friendships for those who spur you on in the Christian life, for those who point you to godliness. Think about the effects that your friends are having on you. They're the ones, the ones who are following Christ, who you want to be your running partners. I remember when uh, Megan uh, ran a marathon when we were first married, uh, I ran the last six miles with her because that's about all I could do. Um, but that last six miles is kind of forever ingrained in my mind because people lose grasp of reality from about mile 22 to mile 26. I mean, you see people doing some crazy things. It's a bit of a surreal environment. I remember one guy who was running alone, uh, he just started yelling at himself. Uh, he, he said, what am I doing? And, and he, he, just, he just walked off the course. Well, there he went. I don't know where he was going. He just, he's yelling at himself. Um, but then I remember this couple, similarly, ha having trouble. The, the, the woman is, is kind of, she's just, it seems like she couldn't get what was straight. She kept veering. She kept veering over here. And so her husband just kept kind of linking her arm and bringing her back on the path. And it, it stuck there for me. I mean, actually, that kind of dangerous to do, but Megan started doing something similar, and I had to kind of bring her back. But it, it stuck in my mind of what we need in a running partner. But when we begin to veer off the path, who's going to take our arm and say, no, 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 back on here? Choose your running partners carefully. Brothers and sisters, running the race of the Christian life is hard. Pressing on is hard. You need fellow runners, running partners, people who are truly running the race towards holiness and Christ's likeness, people who can keep you on the course. So make choices to invest in those relationships now. It's the third thing we need, friends. But let's consider fourth and finally, the fuel that we need for sanctification, the fuel, verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body 
by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Any good coach, just like any good theologian, knows that you can't just tell people what to do. You have to tell them why they should do it. You have to deal with motivation. The, the reason, the motivation, becomes the fuel for the athlete, the runner, and the Christian. Uh, I like that, that little connecting word in, in the ESV here is but. I think the New King James has it better for our citizenship is in heaven. I think the reason is being given here why we press on, why we strain towards the goal to win the prize, why imitate Paul in placing knowing Christ first, why say no to your appetites and your fleshly desires. Well, here's why. Our citizenship is in heaven. You know, the Philippians were proud of their Roman citizenship. Their region had helped the, the Roman army win a crucial battle, and so it, as a reward, they were granted Roman citizenship. It was prized for them. Paul wants them to know that this is not what defines them. Heaven is their home country, not Philippi. They're expatriates. They are sojourners in a foreign land. He's telling them here to check their passport. And not only are they citizens of another land sojourning here, but they're waiting for something. I love it how often Paul mixes his metaphors. So one moment we're running, the next we're waiting. We're running and waiting. Let's go ahead, we can mix those metaphors together. The finish line for us is either death or it's the return of Christ. Either way, he is the one who, by his coming, will mark the end of the race. He says, from heaven we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You know, your view of Jesus Christ defines you more than anything else. The second person of the triune God, incarnate by the Virgin Mary, crucified under Pontius Pilate. On the third day, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. He, the Savior of all who will believe, the Lord of heaven, will return one day for his bride and the glorious marriage supper of the Lamb. And you know what happens on that day? Well, the running can stop. The pressing on and the straining towards the goal will no longer be necessary. Even the physical ailments, the oppression of the sinful nature will fall away as he transforms our bodies, frail, fallen, perishable, to be like his glorious body. We can't even fathom what that means, to be eternal, to be immortal, to be imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed. Twinkling of an eye, an instant, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. And then look at the close here. All of this fuel to run, our citizenship in heaven, the coming Savior, the transformation of our bodies. But the final thing he includes in his exhortation is just the person of Jesus Christ himself. His glorious body and his power in view. We're told that his power that will transform us the same power that's at work subjecting all things to himself. Beloved, so many have an anemic view of the Lord Jesus Christ. But just look at it here. The Savior, the Lord, the powerful one who has all things in subjection to him. This is the fulfillment of the, the Old Testament, Psalm 8, who tells us that God will subject all things to his Messiah. We turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and we read that, that Jesus will then turn over all things to God the Father so that God might be all in all. Jesus is the prize, he's the goal, and he's the fuel. We talked in the beginning about that story of John Stephen Aquari. You know, many people have used that story as a motivational tool. You can get on YouTube and, and hear many a motivational speaker. I mean, it just... It, the message just preaches itself, right? But, but I think as often as I've listened to people talk about John Stephen Aquari, they miss something in his statement that is in fact the key. 
Be because his story is usually used how? It's, it's usually used as the indomitability of the human spirit to overcome hardship. So you can do it too. But is, is that what he said? Is that what Aquari said? What, what, were the, what were the first words he said there? My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race, but to finish the race. It was his country. It was love of his country that led him to run. And so it is here. Why does Paul say in the final analysis that you should press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called you heavenward? Because our citizenship is in heaven. And, and we love our heavenly country because we love our king. And that's where he is. That's, that's who we want to go and be with. The human spirit is not why we run. It's love of our country and love of our king. So, beloved, run the race. Press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, you've been so good to us in so many ways. We thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ and the salvation that is ours through his righteousness. And we pray now that you would give us a zeal in pursuing you and an endurance in running the race of this Christian life. We do look forward to your return and to being with you forever in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Before we run, will you stand and will you sing with me? Please forgive me.